uh, would you stand to your feet for the word of the Lord? Uh, the Holy Spirit has, uh, I believe, gone ahead and uh, really uh, preached uh, the ending of the message uh, to, to us already. Uh, and so uh, what I endeavor to do is in short order, uh, just maybe fill in the lines and fill in the blanks uh, and give us language through the scripture uh, for what he is already uh, saying to us through worship and through our time together. I want to start in Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. The scripture says this. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for what you have already begun among us. Thank you for the testimonies that we are going to step into. Thank you, Lord, for the, the beautiful reports that will come back of those who have been transformed and changed by your presence. Lord, I thank you that you choose to visit us. I thank you that it's not because of our goodness or our righteousness or our doing that you reveal yourself among us, but it is simply because of your goodness, your mercy, your love and your kindness that you show up in the midst of your people and you do what only you can do. Now, Father, I ask for a fresh grace, a fresh anointing to communicate your heart in this moment. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would go beyond all of my limitations to speak a word in season to us, giving us language for where we are and where you are inviting us into. I thank you that when you invite us into a battle, it is for no other purpose than for the sake of victory. And so, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that what, we, what that which has been declared already through song and has been exhorted about, Father, I pray that by the reading and the revelation of your scripture, Lord, we become rooted in our heart. May the word of God, which is seed, fall upon good soil which is our heart and may it produce a harvest in our lives and would you save souls in Jesus name someone said amen amen you may be seated I am going to be respectful and honoring of our time together uh, I'm so thankful for how the Lord has met us uh, in this house and in this place uh, and uh, I, this wasn't a part of my message but I was sharing uh, something to our staff uh, alerted a little earlier this week about reliability uh, and, and talking about that of how that looks within an organization but uh, to the close of our time uh, I talked about uh, Leviticus where uh, God instructs Aaron and Moses that the fire upon the altar uh, should never go out uh, that the fire should be kept burning and I I want to say uh, just publicly that I'm so grateful that there is a place that I can go to where the fire is always burning. Uh, I, I understand that is the presence of God, uh, but, but, but specifically you are a blessed people and we are a blessed people that whenever we come, we can expect, uh, we can count on it that the presence of God will be here and that the fire of God will meet us. There is a level of reliability, even so to the point where a few weeks ago, uh, there was an individual who visited deeper, uh, who had just gone through a very difficult time, had found out some very bad news, and the Spirit of God uh, gave us a word of knowledge that affected that individual, and they heard the word of the Lord in that moment. What we found out later uh, was they said that uh, I, I knew that if there was going to be one place where I'd hear the word of the Lord, it was going to be at Deeper Fellowship Church. That's somebody who's saying and giving a testimony that there's fire that's always burning and a presence that is always tangible amongst the people of God. If you're grateful for the presence of the Lord, give him praise in this place. 
The Holy Spirit ha has been speaking to us in a significant way, uh, and we are endeavoring uh, to the best of our ability to give language and revelation uh, based on what the Spirit is doing among us uh, to help us embrace, to steward, uh, and, and appropriate all that God is doing. I want you to know that whoever stands up here before you uh, and tells you that they have all the revelation or they have all the understanding uh, or they have all the insight as to what God is doing, uh, that is false and that is a lie. We st stand up here humbly before you, doing our best by the, the power of the Holy Spirit and through his word to, to communicate to you that which we believe is upon the Lord's heart. And the Lord last week uh, began to give us language and a posture, and not just a posture, an invitation into a lifestyle uh, that is going to be necessary if we are going to see a move of God uh, within our nation, within our generation, and even if you want to, to boil it down to your own life, if you are going to see a miraculous supernatural move of God uh, uh, that happens in your life, there is going to be certain postures that the Holy Spirit invites you into. And what you need to know, family, and I believe you can already sense it and see it, is that the Holy Spirit is moving among us. This is not something that we are referring to as just something that's taking place in the past, and we're also not talking about some distant move of God that is going to happen in the future, right now, currently today as we speak as you are sitting here as you continue to attend and partake and participate in what God is doing God is is moving. People are being healed. People are being transformed. People are being delivered. People are being set free from addictions. And the Spirit of God are, is doing a number of things among us to that, that is worthy of praise and celebration. Just this past week, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the individuals on our staff pulled me into the office and they said they got a report from someone uh, who was in a service while we gave a call uh, uh, by word of knowledge about the Lord wanting to heal breast cancer. And this individual was happy to report and share the testimony that what the doctors originally thought uh, was breast cancer and, and something that would be uh, some sort of invasive situation in their body. Uh, they got the report just last week when they went to the doctor again. The scans were run again and, and the reports were run again. They are completely cancer free by the power of God. Only the Lord can do that. Only his power can do that. And I declare to that to many of you, they're going to run the tests again and they will not find that which they thought they saw because this is what our God is doing in this hour. He is demonstrating his power and he's not just doing it so we can even just have a, a testimony to shout about. He's actually giving us the first fruits or an invitation into the more that he wants to do. And we have labeled this not by our own reasoning or our own deduction but through the scripture based on Mark chapter 4 we have have come to understand that the blade of revival is here that, that what God is doing among us is the sign of the future fullness or future harvest uh, that he intends to do among us. And so we see this blade of revival coming through the ground where there was once no uh, uh, sign of life or sign of growth, where there was just one seed and soil covering the seed. We now are excited and exuberant and rejoicing and giving the Lord praise and saying things like, shout now, don't wait till the battle is over and the reason we're saying that is because the blade that we see, the little that we see, the power of God that we see, the authority of Christ demonstrated amongst the people that we see is giving us full cause to say this is just the beginning and we haven't seen anything yet. I want you to know that when you begin to sing hallelujah, hallelujah, you're not just singing a testimony but you're also prophesying to the future to say these will be the words I declare over my life. I will shout hallelujah. I will sing hallelujah because my God is on the move. So we see this blade of revival coming through the ground. But the Holy Spirit uh, encouraged us last week. I would say even gently warned us last week that the blade is meant to encourage us and not to satisfy us. That what we are seeing God do in, in what we would call an infancy stage or beginning stages is something that should cause us to rejoice. It is something that should cause us to give the Lord praise. It is something that should cause us to shout. But at the same time, it should not become 
become an appetite suppressant. It shouldn't cause you to lose your hunger. It shouldn't cause you to lose your desperation. It shouldn't cause your prayer life to go quiet. It shouldn't decrease your time in the word. It shouldn't decrease your passion or your zeal. It shouldn't produce in you a complacent heart that says it will just happen if I'm in the atmosphere. No, 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 no. If I am seeing it, it is because heaven is inviting me to say there is more and I want you to partner with it. When I was growing up, I, 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 had, I began to experience something uh, that, that, that uh, many of you who maybe are, uh, have younger siblings or uh, maybe if you're a firstborn child, which I am, you, you can understand this. And uh, I, I happen to be uh, the oldest of uh, five children uh, that my parents uh, have birthed together. And so I have four siblings, two, uh, two brothers and two sisters uh, who I love dearly. Uh, if they're watching, I love you so much. I miss you. Can't wait to see you in July, in Jesus' name. Uh, but 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 uh, I had the privilege of being the eldest brother, and I enjoyed being the eldest brother. I love being the eldest brother until I began to see uh, my younger siblings begin to get away with things that I wasn't allowed to get away with. Oh, I, I heard that firstborn, that firstborn witness in the house uh, uh, where, where, where you began to see uh, that there were certain things that they were allowed to do, certain bedtimes that they were allowed to have, certain music that they were allowed to listen to, certain, certain friends that they were allowed to bring over, certain specific romantic friends that they were allowed to engage with, that, that when it was your turn, uh, you weren't allowed such privileges. Uh, you were talking, you were talked to sternly or you were disciplined or you were, you were corrected. And so uh, you would watch, uh, I remember uh, there's an 18 year gap between uh, the youngest and, and myself. Uh, that's my baby sister, lovely Tiffany. Uh, she, she's amazing. She's brilliant. She's turning 14 this year, which is hard for me to believe. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I, I would watch as my parents allowed this four or five or six year old just to roam freely around the house, eat whatever she pleases, stay up and watch movies to all hours of the night. But when it was me, it was in bed by 8.30 a.m. 8.30 p.m. And so, so it caused me to, to say, what, what in the world is going on? And then I began to have children of my own. And, and I'm sure those of you who have multiple children, how many remember how intense it was when you had your first child? How, how watchful you were, uh, uh, how every little sneeze or cough or giggle or, or, or whatever bowel movement caused you to, to go onto WebMD and see, is this, is this normal? You know, and, and you would scare yourself sometimes because some of the things, my God, on Google, they'd be scaring me sometimes. I, you know, I thought I just had a hangnail, but they said it might be, you know, some sort of debilitating disease. Uh, but, 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 you, but you would go on there and you would see all sorts of things. And so I remember when, when Levi was first born, uh, uh, my wife affectionately called me psycho uh, when, I, when Levi was born because I, I, was, I was very intense. Uh, you know, the car, I was a crazy driver before Levi came. Now I'm driving like Miss Daisy, just, you know, just taking my time. Every pothole I would avoid, even those little bumps in between the lanes, you know, on the highway, I'm trying to avoid those because I don't want anything to upset uh, uh, the car seat. I'm making sure the car seat is perfectly aligned and adjusted uh, and we could not go anywhere or do anything until he was perfectly strapped in. I need to make sure the car seat lined up with those little jelly lines on the side to make sure that everything was fine. It, it was my care and my intentionality because this was my first and this, this beautiful child who's so precious and marked by God. Hear me, Levi. You are marked by God. You are a man of God. You will be a man of his word, a man of his presence, a man of his people, a man that loves his house, a man that loves his word, a man who worships, a man who prophesies. You will never speak spend a day in the world. You will always walk after the ways of God. You will spend all of your days in the house of God and walk in righteousness. You shall affect your generation. You shall change your generation. God has called you and appointed you. You are a man of God. So I just had to prophesy over my son real quick. Oh, you better prophesy over your children. You better speak over your children. You better tell them and declare the destiny and the purposes of God. That precious man of God. I, I, I look at them in the morning and they wake up and I tell them, you are a man of God. I'm not just raising boys to become athletes and, and hard workers. I'm raising men of God who will accomplish all that God has placed in them. 
So you find yourself, thank you so much for the help on my mic. Uh, you find yourself, that, that's, a, that's a loving father. He, 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 he sent a signal to, to those in the back to, to help me because my voice is, is, is going up yonder. Amen. Uh, but, but we, we uh, sorry, I'm church, y'all. Uh, so, so, so you find, find, you're paying all this attention to this, this, this beautiful baby boy and you're watching over everything. And, and, and now um, the third born, God bless his heart, Kairos. For the first two years, Levi was a vegan. <laughs> he ate no meat, or, or maybe vegetarian. He was a vegetarian. He, he ate no meat. He, we were so careful watching everything on the label, looking at what's on the back of this content. The third board, just on Saturday, ate a whole Chick-fil-A chicken, chicken mini biscuit all by himself with the, with the little hard gums that he got. He don't even got teeth, but he's swallowing that sucker down, enjoying it, because that's God's food. Amen. I'm a little more relaxed now, lived a little bit, but the truth of the matter is, is how I care for something in its infancy can determine whether or not it will grow into maturity. How I care for something in its infancy can determine whether or not how it grows into maturity. If I decide to ignore it and be negligent in its infancy while they're children, if I decide that I'm not going to invest in discipline and correction, and I'm not going to tell them the way they should go, if I decide I'm not going to teach them the word of God, and I'm not going to give them an example of what it is to walk in righteousness and integrity, if they never see daddy lift his hands, and worship God and jump up and down. That's why some of you, you, you ought to get all, your feet off the floor when the, when the atmosphere hey, calls for it because your children are watching and what you're doing is not just giving all praise, although you're doing that. What you're doing is giving a righteous example to children to show, oh, daddy praises the Lord, so I'll praise the Lord. Daddy worships God, so I'm going to worship God. You're not just worshiping, you're sowing a seed. If I neglect what is an in infancy and in baby form and in blade form, if I decide not to cherish it, not to nurture it, not to honor it, not to care for it, it will severely impact how or if it grows and develops into maturity. This is the Spirit of God inviting us as a community to say, I want you to partner with me in this hour, in this moment, as the blade is coming through the ground, as I've given you the promise of revival, I want you to partner with me. And the way that the Spirit of God has begun to speak to us is I want you to partner with me in the place of prayer. I want you to get on your knees and cry out to me. I want you to feel the burden of your city and the burden of your family. And I want you to feel the burdens of your nation. And I, I want you to, to pay attention to the dry bones around you. I, I want you to recognize the depravity and the brokenness and the shame that has plagued your generation. And I want you to partner with me in prayer because no move of God has ever happened in the earth, in the history of the earth, without prayer. As it pertains to revival and seeing a move of God in a people, in a church, in a city, in a region or a nation. It's not going to happen without a people who are consistent and persistent in the places of prayer or in the place of prayer. And so if you're hearing me this morning or this afternoon and I'm speaking with such urgency, it is because what is as a blade in the stage of infancy must be cared for must be tended for if we are going to see it develop into something that is mature, long-lasting, something that is generational, something that outlives us, something that encapsulates the nations, something that our great-grandchildren will say, I'm still living in a move of God. I don't know about you, but I don't want my grandchildren or my great-grandchildren or they great-grandchildren speaking to the move of God as some past relic, something in a museum just to be visited. No, I want forever my my, my family, as for me and my house, I don't know about your house, but as for me and my house, I want them always to be living and active in a move of God. Now, we could spend a considerable amount of time talking about the benefits of prayer, 
talking about the functions of prayer, talking about the reasons why we should pray, but, but, but for our time together and for the sake of time, I, I simply want to narrow in on one reason why we must pray in this hour. It's not something that we should take as a suggestion. It's not something we should take as a good idea coming from a, a guy on a platform wearing a big sweater in the middle of summer in Florida. My God. It, it, it is not something we are taking as, as instruction from human, but, uh, from a human. No, no, no. This, this is an instruction, uh, 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 almost an urgent instruction and command from the Lord who is saying, I desire for what has begun in infancy to grow into maturity. Anybody in your life, you have some blades poking through the ground. It's not the full thing, but it's something. It's not everything, but it is something. I believe that it is God's destiny and it is God's intent that whatever has grown in blade form matures into a full mature harvest. The truth of the matter is, is that prayer is is unavoidable if we are reading the biblical story and narrative from Genesis to Revelation prayer is a part of the story it is how we are transformed it is how we receive answers it is how we receive mercy and favor strength instruction and healing whether you want to walk in power, operate in wisdom, intercede on behalf of others, conquer nations, be delivered out of trouble, stand in integrity, build up your innermost being, see a drought come to an end, or endure persecution, or receive forgiveness and restoration, all of it we see in the scripture comes by the way of prayer. Those who do not pray miss out on a lot of things that I just mentioned there. When you are refusing to pray, James says, if you need wisdom, ask. And he'll give it to you without measure. Did you know you don't have to go into the boardroom meeting by yourself? Did you know that you don't have to sit at the table and say, uh, I'm, uh, I don't know. No, no, no. If you ask him for wisdom, he'll give it to you. Did you know you're not by yourself while you parent? Did you know that, that when you don't know what to do, you can pray in the Holy Spirit and he'll say, do this, do that. It's a season of discipline. It's a season of affirmation. And all of a sudden, that wayward child that was going in a crazy direction is rerouted all because you prayed. I don't know. How you can be a Christian in the world that we live in and not pray. I would lose my mind. I would, I'm, I, I'm, some of you already think I'm psycho. I would be psycho if I didn't pray. If, you, if, you're, if you're going to avoid prayer but somehow think you'll be a successful believer, you, 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 you are sorely mistaken. This, this thing cannot be avoided. But today I, I want you to focus in on something because God is doing something uh, and is, is moving among us. And we see something in infancy growing among us. A blade of revival, a blade of healing, a blade of deliverance, a blade of victory, a blade of God's power, a blade of the nations coming to know the Lord. We can see it happening if you're paying attention to what's happening around the nations of the earth God is on the move and I am excited I'm excited because I just believe that in my generation I will see a global move of the spirit of God I know what you may think I know you may look at the outside circumstances and say Russia is this and Ukraine is that and China is that and we see this in Sudan I know I know what you see and I'm not making light of the misery and the pain that some others are experiencing but what I I am saying is if there are a people who will pray and seek the face of God, God will respond to the cries of his people and pour out his spirit upon all flesh. The truth of the matter is that while the blade 
has pierced through the ground. And while God is ensuring that there is increase for one man plants and another man waters, but it is God who brings the increase. The scripture also talks about the parable of the wheat and the tares. And there was someone also present in the field. There is someone also present in your life. And with Adam and Eve, it was, yes, God was with them walking in the cool of the day. But there was also another presence in the garden. There was an adversary. There was an enemy who would love nothing more than to destroy that which God has planted. Would like to do nothing more than cause confusion and chaos and calamity. But I'm so grateful that the God has already gone before me to say that we are victorious. We are victorious. You and I have been marked for victory. We see all throughout scripture is that whenever something begins in infancy, the devil shows up trying to destroy it. Just ask, uh, 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 just ask the Hebrew boys or just ask uh, the Hebrew people. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua. When you help the Hebrew woman as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. This was the attempted infanticide by Pharaoh who came to destroy the baby boys for the Hebrew people were growing at such an alarming rate and he, because he was afraid, because he was scared this, this Pharaoh who represents a spirit who, who comes now to destroy the infant child because he understood that if I can, I can exterminate the infant boys, they never have the opportunity to grow up and become men, men who have the a potential to fight, men who have the potential to war, men who have the potential to learn the wielding of a sword and a spear and a javelin. And so before there's any potential that outgrows where they are in infancy, I've come to put an end to it. This is the work of the adversary. We see this in the life of Jesus. I won't read it for time's sake, but in Matthew chapter 2, between 13 and 20, we see that the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream after Jesus is born, and he sends them to Egypt for Herod had intention of killing the child. Uh, Herod asked the wise men to come and tell him tell him where the child lay, for he also wanted to worship the child. And, and so the, the, the magi, they take a different route, and they do not go back and the scripture says that this infuriated Herod and so what he did is he sent out an army to go and slay every child that was two and under it was this demonic spirit released within a city to try and exterminate the seed which is Christ but it was unsuccessful for God was in the midst and Jesus was hidden in Egypt what I want you to know is that when anything begins in infancy the adversary appears trying to destroy it if you look at your own life, when you gave your life to Christ, you were facing some fierce attacks just after you surrendered to him. If you look at any of the things that have begun in your life, if you watch the patterns of your life, something I've begun to do very often is watch the patterns in my life. And any time I, I see something break through the ground or I see the beginnings of something, inevitably the adversary shows up trying to inflict harm, trying to inflict pain, trying to inflict brokenheartedness, trying to cause confusion. Sometimes it's not even calamity. He'll just sow a distraction or he'll sow a negative thought. He'll try to get you offended or he'll try to hold, get you to hold unforgiveness whatever it is he shows up when something begins in infancy trying to destroy its potential so why would we think deeper fellowship that if we see a blade that there also isn't an adversary that sees it as well if we see a blade if we're rejoicing over a blade, if we're honoring the blade, if we're giving God praise and glory over the blade, guess what hell has heard the sound released from a people who are rejoicing over what God has done? Now, 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 now let's just get it out of your head. The, the devil is not the boogeyman who, who can just do whatever he wants. As you've already heard it, he's a dog on a leash. He can go only as far as the Lord allows him. We serve a God that is all powerful. And I want you to know, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but if God invites you in, into a battle it is for no other purpose than releasing a victory 
hear me child of God he didn't allow you to be invited into a battle for the sake of losing or the mockery of his name no if he allowed there to be a battle it's because he wants to make much of his name he has no intention of his name being profaned or mocked. He has every intention of him rising and reigning as the glorious and mighty, victorious God, the glorious champion, the Lion of Judah, who roars over his people and declares, you are victorious. So he showed up in Exodus and he showed up in Matthew. We also see him show up when Nehemiah began the work on the wall. And it gets me to thinking, in Isaiah 62, verse 6, it says this, O Jerusalem, I have posted watchmen on your walls. They will pray day and night continually. Take no rest. All you who pray to the Lord, give the Lord no rest until he completes his work. Until he makes Jerusalem the pride of the earth. If God was post watchmen on the wall when the work is not completed, why would we think that we should get off the wall in the place of prayer just thinking that something in its infancy will reach its completion without watching? God says, I'm placing watchmen on the wall. And there are two purposes of watchmen. One, they are to, to speak or to celebrate or to communicate celebratory or news that causes the people to rejoice so if there is good news they celebrate and they tell the people this is what is happening but there's also a second role which is many of us what we would know of the watchmen is that they are also to keep a lookout for potential danger there to keep a lookout for that which could threaten the livelihood and the vitality of the people in the city and so if God places watchmen who pray day and night we should be a people who say, Lord, if you have begun something among us, we will take up our position on the wall to pray day and night. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6 gives us a little bit of an indication of how the devil works, how he prowls, of how he chooses to try and destroy. First Peter 5, verse 6 says, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Let me just parenthetically insert this. You will have no victory over the demonic if you don't first humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Just shouting Jesus doesn't cause demons to tremble. Okay. Jesus is not a magic word that you just say over and over. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus. No, no, no. It is a life lived under the authority of Christ that gives power to the name of Jesus in your life. I'm going to tell you a story. Just this past week, an individual, the Lord had us uh, praying for them to see deliverance come in their life. And, and as they were under uh, uh, the, this possession that was manifesting, they, they said this. I know this might scare some of y'all. They said, who are you? Now, if you know the scripture, this was a question asked to the sons of Sceva who tried to cast out a demon. They say, they say, we know Paul, we know Jesus, but who are you? And so I understood that the demon was trying to mock me, trying to convince me that I have no relationship with Christ. And so I replied back to the demon. I said, it doesn't matter who I am. I come in the authority of Jesus Christ. And in the name of Jesus, all of you must go. And guess what? She was set free and delivered. Because if you're invited into a battle, it is for the sake of victory. So if you are going to see any power over the demonic realm, if you're going to exercise any, don't try to cast out demons while not under the mighty hand of God. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. At the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Stay alert. Stay alert. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil, not people, not haters, not people in the comments. Your great enemy, the devil, 
He prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Notice that the devil is not prejudiced. He doesn't care if you're a pastor's son or if you live on the street or you live in a nice house or you live in no house at all. He doesn't care who you are, where you are. He looks for anyone he can devour. Now, now, any of you ever watch Animal Planet uh, uh, or any of those Netflix documentaries where they're talking about our planet and this planet and, and amen, hallelujah, we thank the Lord for all the research and all the scientific stuff. I would not be out there doing it, but my God, we thank the Lord for all the people doing it. Amen. I want to look at it from afar. It's a blessing from afar. It's a blessing on Netflix, but I don't need to go and discover if the lion really bites. He bites. Amen. Uh, <laughs> Now, honestly, you know, I, I have this whole thing where I'm part Jamaican and, and Canadian, so I got this dual nature <laughs> warring in me where I want to be explorative and I want to, you know, just, okay, that's not for me. Um, some of y'all missed it, it's okay. Um, but, but, but if you watch Animal Planet, you will see specifically the, 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 the felines, uh, these big cats that, that go and hunt. You see that these, these, these hunting scenes are devised and every single one, it is predictable without a shadow of a doubt. Every single time one of these little animals, whether it's an antelope or, or a zebra or, or God bless any of those, those Serengeti animals that are out there, any of the ones that the, the lions like to eat, all right? Uh, whenever the, the lion goes to destroy it, there are usually a few circumstances surrounding the, the prey that we need to pay attention. One, oftentimes they will find the prey that is alone. They will find the prey that is isolated. That's why you need to be in community. That's why you need to have brothers and sisters that walk with you, who pray with you, who you can call up on the phone and say, listen, the enemy has really been attacking my mind and trying to convince me to get out of the plan and the will of God. And that's when that brother or sister says, come here. We're not going to allow the enemy to wreak havoc in your life. And they start declaring blessing and favor and the promises and the prophecy of God over your life. When you isolate yourself, I know you think you're protecting yourself, but you are making yourself most vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. The other condition that you may see of an animal who becomes prey is that they are injured. They have injured a leg or injured a limb and so because they are unable to, to keep up with, with the pace of the herd or because of their injury, the, the, the lion uh, 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 seeks out and, and looks and finds that which one is injured. Uh, this is why it's so important to get healed y'all. I'm not talking about physical healing. I'm talking about your mental health, your emotional health, that, your, that, that you actually forgive and let go of offense. It's important that you, when people wound you and betray you, that you don't just brush by and say, I'm blessed and highly favored. No, get in the presence of the Lord and say, listen, God, I'm crying out to you from the ends of the earth. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You are the bomb in Gilead with the, with the sow to soothe my ointments. This is why it's important to get healed because when you are injured you become susceptible to the attack of the enemy you also find that the enemy will attack those who are distracted the animal that has his head grazing in the ground, not paying attention to the lion or the cheetah or the leopard or the jaguar that is slowly crouching and coming closer with every step, silently, not announcing and stuff. Y'all scared about the, the devil's going to take me out with this, with this, this shoelace. Amen. We, we, we cast out that shoelace demon in the name of Jesus. This is why you do life in community. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. How beautiful are the feet of those who share the gospel of peace. <laughs> so we find ourselves 
in this in this hour and in this moment where we see that that the enemy will also pray uh, against those who are alone uh, those who are injured and those who are distracted those who do are not paying careful attention to the danger that is looming around them and while that animal or that antelope grazes in the field with head down enjoying its meal there is an adversary that is coming closer and closer and closer and if not for the mercy of the Lord and the grace of God the distraction of the animal will lead to its demise as the adversary prowls seeking who may devour now, I do not say this to scare you. I do not say this to make you afraid. I say this to make us aware of the fact that we do have an adversary that would love to sabotage your walk with God, that would love to disrupt your intimacy with the Lord, that would love to inflict so much heartbreak and pain and offense and disease and distraction in your life that you somehow walk away from God and join him in his rebellion against heaven. But I love what Luke chapter 22 verse 30 one says for the Lord said Simon Simon behold Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat but I have prayed for thee I'm so thankful that Jesus has already gone before us to make intercession before the Father that even when the enemy may want to catch us unaware that even when we are distracted even when we are wounded even when we are feeling the weight of life that there is an intercession that has gone before us to say that even even though this enemy has a desire, God's, pray, God's prayer outweighs the desire of the enemy. I have prayed for thee. I have prayed for thee that thy faith may not fail. Now we come to Acts chapter 12. And this is where we'll spend the rest of our time together as a community, and I'm literally going to close my iPad so that you, you literally, I'm just going to read from the book here, and we're, we're going to go uh, to, to where the Lord, I believe, has for us in these last few moments. Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 12, uh, I want to paint the, the context for you here. Uh, we, we have in Acts chapter 10 and 11 that the gospel is being uh, distributed to the Gentiles. Peter comes into the awareness that, that, that the gospel is for Gentiles, that he is not to call unclean that which God calls clean, that which God has created. And so the gospel is being preached to the Gentiles and there is this great revival that is taking place uh, uh, all throughout the region and uh, Gentiles are receiving the Holy Spirit and Peter is giving explanation as to what is happening and we have the church in Antioch in Syria it is a Antioch of Syria rather that is thriving and growing and so right right while something is, is being birthed, something is happening we see something take place in Acts chapter 12 where King Herod uh, goes and he beheads or rather, he kills James, John's brother. Now, according to Galatians chapter 2, James was one of the pillars of the church, one of the apostles. And so here is King Herod, and it would seem as if the enemy has landed a blow against the church, a, a blow that would cause the church much grief, uh, much fear, much anxiety. What would now be the state of uh, uh, this newfound faith that, that was just getting its, its legs and its wings and its strength, and the communities were, were starting to expand what would happen as now one of the beloved members of the church was now killed and destroyed by King Herod. How, how could it be God that, that, that the church which the ga gates of hell will not prevail against how could this be happening to one of your leaders, to one of the members I, I, again I want to say this to us this is why it is imperative that you pray for your leaders when Herod wanted to stop the movement of the church and please the Jews, he did not go after just anybody. He did not just go from house to house trying to go after any regular attender of the church. No, he went to the head. He went to the leadership in hopes that if I will take out the leadership, I could take out the movement. There is, there is, I, I know may, many of us may not understand it, but I pray that you would learn to be selfless in the place of prayer, specifically for your leaders, because there is a warfare that they have to engage with and to have to come against consistently that many of us have no idea about. And it is the prayers of the saints and the mercy of God that allows them to overcome. They killed James. 
And the scripture says that they had the intention of doing the same thing to Peter. Uh, I'm going to rush here just for the sake of time here. Uh, they arrest Peter. And the scripture says that Herod had the intention of bringing Peter out before trial with the same intention of destroying and killing Peter. And so here was Herod. He saw that the, the killing of James pleased the Jews. And, and so literally a, this bloodthirsty king desires to wreak havoc uh, in the church simply to please a people group that he's not even fully in alignment with. He, he, he's literally doing things for political gain and for political reasoning. And so here he is. He has an intention to kill Peter and to destroy Peter and to inflict another wounding and damaging blow against the church. Here was the church thriving. Here was the church growing. Here was the church reaching Gentiles and people groups that they had never met before. Here was something in infancy that seemingly had the ability to become mature and to spread to generations and nations but here comes the adversary while well, something is in infancy and he has every intention of taking out the church but the scripture says in verse 5 but while Peter was in prison the church prayed very earnestly for him now notice there was no prayers recorded being offered for James. We don't hear of any prayer going up for James. We, we don't hear any petition or intercession going up for James. But it would seem like the church had learned from the previous moment and the previous season to say, we understand that the attack against our brother was the attempt of the enemy to snuff out this movement. And now that there is another attack, now that there is another attempt to snuff out another apostle and another leader, we have learned our lesson and we will not allow what has begun in infancy to be snuffed out without prayer we are going to get on our face and we are going to pray and the scripture says that they began to pray and intercede and while they were in prayer uh, that Peter is in prison and while Peter is in prison the scripture says that the angel of the Lord was sent to deliver Peter out of the prison Peter thought it was a dream he thought it was a vision he thought this is too good to be true how, how could this be happening so quickly how could this be happening so fast he wasn't expecting to be delivered out of the situation but God has sent an angel where the people of God had been praying and this angel takes Peter out of the prison Peter walks out of the prison puts on his clothes walks through the gates it is after he gets out of the gates he realizes my God has come through the angel of the Lord is leading me into victory so they come out of the prison he is, escapes and he comes to the house and he, here is verse 11 where we pick up the story the scripture says Peter finally came to his senses it's really true he said the Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me when he realized this he went to the home of Mary the mother of John Mark many were gathered for prayer many were gathered for prayer. He knocked at the door in the gate and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. Now you could imagine the level of anxiety in poor Peter's heart as he has just been delivered out of a prison where they were going to destroy him. He has been set free miraculously by the angel of the Lord. You can imagine that he is a fugitive on the run. No one is supposed to know that he's out of the prison. By Herod's knowledge and by those that have been kept in the earth, those who have been uh, trusted to keep for him or keep him, keep him in their care, they think Peter is still in the prison. But Peter is out on a walk. I'm sure this walk was not just a, a friendly walk, but it was a brisk walk. It was a, a walk with intention. And he comes to the door, the place of safety, the place let me in. I'm, I'm now going to be able to eat and see my brothers and sisters. And Rhoda leaves him hanging at the door, so excited that the answer had come. She forgot to let the answer in. So Rhoda goes back, verse 14 when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. 
Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James, this is James, the brother of Jesus and the other brothers, that what happened, he said. And then he went to another place at dawn. There was a great commotion among the soldiers about what had happened to Peter. Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough search of him. When he couldn't be found, Herod interrogated the guards and sentenced them to death. Afterward, Herod left Judea to Caesarea for a while. What had happened? The intention of the enemy had been thwarted. The desire of the enemy had been disrupted. I want you to know that the enemy only attacks that which he thinks is a threat. He only attacks that which he thinks is a threat. Some of you need to just be encouraged right now. You need to keep on the track that you're keeping on. You need to stay in the place of prayer that you've been in. You need to stay in the place of consecration that you've been in. You think the attack is some sort of punishment, but it is an actually a, a, a confirming and bringing into evidence that you are actually about to do major damage to the kingdom of darkness. The reason why he's attacking you, the reason why he's afflicting you, the reason why some of the things are happening in your life is because he's afraid of what will happen happen on the other side if Jesus brings you out and Jesus brings you through. <laughs> the attention of the enemy is disrupted by prayer. I, I know that I'm not making a big deal right here, but I want to say it again. The intention of the enemy was disrupted by prayer, not by worship. The intention of the enemy was disrupted by prayer, not by courses. The intention of the enemy was disrupted by prayer, not by knowledge. The intention of the enemy was disrupted by prayer, not through skill. The intention of the enemy was disrupted by prayer, not through talent or networking. It was disrupted by prayer. Whatever you are facing, where it feels like the enemy is gaining ground, the way that you disrupt it is by getting in the place of prayer. If you see that wayward child getting even more wayward, get in the place of prayer. If you see things not changing the way they should be in your finances, get in the place of prayer. If you see an attack on the horizon, get in the place of prayer. The intention of the enemy to extinguish, stomp out, and destroy that which was in infancy was disrupted by prayer. And by prayer, Peter was freed. And by prayer, Peter was liberated. And by prayer, an apostle was preserved for the fullness of his assignment. It, it, it was by prayer that, that the, the, the longevity of Peter's mission in the church would not be cut short because there were a people who prayed. There are some things in your life that you do not need to accept if you will simply get in the place of prayer. Here's where we are, where the Spirit of God would lead us to disrupt the intention of the enemy via prayer. Even the sound that we were releasing, it was a prayer unto God to say every enemy that has arisen, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let every, for the scripture says that our enemy, the devil, uh, uh, he, he is as like a, a lion. He's not a lion. It, it, the, the enemy can only counterfeit that which is real. We serve the lion of Judah, the one who is forever victorious. Now, I could stop here, and this would be enough for you to say, 
every intention of the devil in my life, in my region, in my city, in my nation, in my school, everything that he is meant to do, I will not allow it to happen on my watch uncontended for. I will pray. I will seek his face. And you would be right and you would be righteous for doing such. And if you did that and that was all you did, I would say hallelujah and amen. But the spirit of God illuminated something to me as I was reading the text that is important for us to see because sometimes we think that we're going into the place of prayer or we're going into a, a moment of battle uh, that we're going to be victorious over a certain thing but I've become I've become aware that in my time in my walk with God that every time God invites you into a battle yes it is for the sake of a victory but it's usually for a size of victory that you were not expecting it's usually to give you a type of victory that you had no clue was available. Let me, let me show it to you. I'm going to read this and, and then we'll go home. The scripture says this. Verse 20. Now Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So they sent a delegation to make peace with them because their cities were dependent upon Herod's country for food. The delegates won the support of Blastus, Herod's personal assistant, and an appointment with Herod was granted. When the day arrived, Herod put on his royal robes sat on his throne and made a speech to them. The people gave him a great ovation shouting, it's the voice of God, not of a man. Look at this. Instantly, an angel of the Lord. Now, who was it that showed up in Peter's prison? An angel of the Lord. Who's showing up now when Herod is about to profane the name of the Lord? An angel of the Lord instantly an angel of the Lord struck Herod with a sickness because he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God so he was consumed with worms and died meanwhile the word of God continued to spread and there were many new believers what am I trying to say people of God here you have this great and wicked Herod that was causing all sorts of mayhem and destruction and calamity for the people of God, killing James, arresting Peter, uh, getting people and rounding them up, persecuting the church, threatening the church, being a menace, a demonic force, trying to stamp out the movement of the church. And this Herod is wreaking havoc. And so he tries to imprison Peter and kill Peter. But because the church prayed, the intention of the devil was disrupted by a people in the place of prayer. And it would seem like that was all there was. It would seem like that was the only answer it would seem like that was the only thing that God wanted to accomplish through a people who prayed but God said I'm not just going to allow Peter to be delivered I'm going to appoint it that the thing that has been a menace to my people for generations the thing that has been trying to destroy my people day after day trying to behead and kill and persecute I'm going to allow the prayers of the saints to rescue Peter and execute Herod I'm going to allow the prayers of the saints to rescue Peter and let every enemy that has been opposing my church be scattered. I'm just catching my breath. I'm just catching my breath. But I'm telling you, God has invited us into the place of prayer. Not just to deliver you out of some circumstances. But there have been some generational spirits and adversaries in your family, in your life, in your region. And in the place of prayer, the enemy's plans will be disrupted. And the enemy will fall. This menace to the people of God. God said, I'm going to allow Peter to be captured to get my people to pray. And they think they're praying just about Peter. But I'm going to use the prayers of the righteous. I'm going to orchestrate some circumstances where Herod thinks it's because of him. And he's going to lift up his name to blaspheme the name of the Lord. And I will use it to take him out so that the gospel will spread. And that many believers will be edified and strengthened. I want you to know that your prayers are disrupting the intention 
of your adversary. Stand to your feet all across this room. Stand to your feet all across this room. Your prayers are disrupting the intention of your adversary. That's why God invited us into the place of prayer because he knows there's an adversary that would love to snuff out the blade of revival that is among his people. But he says, I'm going to send a word ahead of you and I'm going to send a sound ahead of you, a sound of victory. The sound that you heard was prophesying to you about the future victory that you will have if you will be willing to disrupt the intention of the enemy in the place of prayer. Would you lift those hands all across this room? And would you begin to pray right now where you are? Would you begin to pray right now where you are? And would you begin to disrupt the plans of the enemy right now, wherever you are? Begin to disrupt the plans of the enemy. Begin with your person. Begin with your home. Begin with your house. But begin to disrupt the plans of the enemy. The plans of the enemy. Things that the enemy has done. Things that the enemy is showing his head to do in your life. We go ahead of it by the power and by the spirit of God. And we disrupt the intention of the enemy and we say devil you are defeated everything that you would attempt to do against the people of God oh it must be cast down in the name of Jesus and not only will you deliver us out of trouble oh but you will vanquish our enemies once and for all oh the Egyptians you see you shall see no more the Herod that you see you shall see no more oh the Pharaoh that you see you shall see no more for there are a people who know their call and in the place of prayer will disrupt the intention of the enemy come on would you pray 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 the people of God prayed until the door opened with the answer which was Peter coming knocking on the door the people of God prayed until the door answered this is not just some prayer we pray once and we move on but this is our people who say God we are disrupting every intention of the enemy in my life and those around me we will disrupt it in the place of prayer right at the end of this message because I got a chance to hear this in the, the first gathering and to get preached here again. And I need you to understand the power of what we are hearing because it's not just a suggestion or a, a mental assent or somebody just reading a scripture and saying, I need to pray, need to encourage us to pray. There is a reason why the Lord is bringing us to this point. And I, I, I need to tell, uh, sanitize it a little bit, the testimony of how we got here because I need you to understand the power of this scripture. The power of verse 20, 21, 22, and 23 in Acts chapter 12. Because this church, and I have to tell this in a sanitized way, but when we were contending in the place of prayer for this building, there were a number of things that we were contending for, but it wasn't moving. What we did not know, just like the people of God in Acts 12 did not know, they were praying for Peter. But God did something about Herod. What I need you to understand, just so that you know, because this is a testimony we just don't tell because some people can't handle it. But I need you to hear what God wants to do in the place of prayer. We were praying and there was a number of things happening, but there was an individual in the place of authority who made these words. As long as I'm alive, Deeper Fellowship Church will never have this property. We prayed. We did not know the man said that. And then without us knowing, a healthy man dropped dead. And that's how we got in this building. I need you to get the weight of the word. I need you to get the weight of this word. We've never said that because we don't celebrate the death of a man. But what it represents is a spirit that was opposing the people of God. And what I need you to understand is when you are being encouraged in a place of prayer, this message is prophetic in nature. It's God saying, I'm trying to get you ahead of some things so that as you pray, you can partner with me in a place of prayer and I can begin to move the enemy that you see and the enemy that you weren't even praying about. There are some things that God's going to move if you will begin to pray that you didn't even know you needed to pray. God said, all I needed you to do was to take faith, lift up your voice, pray, 
pray about that thing and I'll do what you weren't even asking for. I'll do what you weren't even asking for. I'll deal with the spirit that you didn't even know the name of. I'll deal with the root of the thing. I'll deal with the thing you didn't know how to call out. That is what the Lord is saying to us in this moment. And so would you take another 30 seconds and earnestly lift up your voice and partner with God in the place of prayer. Everything that God wants to do for you. Everything that God wants to do through you. You may not even know how to articulate it. But what the Lord is saying is if you will pray, I will move in places that you know not of. If you will pray, I will do things that you didn't even know how to ask. If you will pray, I will move spirits out of the way. I'll move principalities out of the way. I'll move delay out of the way. I'll give you favor. You'll walk through doors that you didn't even know you would have. Would you lift up your voice and pray? Come on, the people of God who know their God, would you lift up your voice and pray? Would you lift up your voice and pray? Would you lift up your voice and pray? Now that you know He's fighting on your behalf, now that you know that He's doing things that you can't even articulate, things that you didn't even know existed, these are things that the heaven heavens have opened to see uh, us walk into. We are in a moment where the Holy Spirit is inviting His people to pray and He's going to release answers to His people that will astound you. But where are the people that will say I will partner with Almighty God in disrupting the intention of the enemy in my generation the intention of the enemy in my nation the intention of the enemy in my family I will not allow him to carry on and do what he pleases but I will stand in the place of prayer and watch as God arises and his enemies be scattered would you pray What some of you need to understand is some of the things you're coming up against, they're not just situations, they're not just circumstances, they are spirits meant to keep you, keep you in a certain place. There are spirits and powers that the devil has unleashed to keep you poor, to keep you bound, to keep you sick, to keep you in the place that you are. And it is the intention of God to release an answer to you in this hour and in this moment. If you will pray, if you will seek him, it's not just a circumstance. It is a spirit. It's not just things happening in your family. It's a spirit sent to take out your lineage and your bloodline. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we say every intention of the enemy, may it be disrupted and canceled in the name of Jesus. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There's some strongholds in the lives of your family members. There's some strongholds in certain places. In the name of Jesus, would you pull it down? In Jesus' name, there are some things that are about to fall down when the people of God pray. wondering if there's any persistent widows in the room. I wonder if there's anybody like the woman in Luke 18 who will say, give me justice against my adversary. Give me justice against my adversary. Give me justice against my adversary. Anyone in the room who's willing to cry out day and night until the Lord answers. Anybody willing to be like the watchman on the wall that will give the Lord no rest, would neither take no rest until he completes the work that he started over the, everyone who asks. Will 
will receive and everyone who seeks finds and to him who knocks the door will be open where are the people of God that say I will not allow the devil to do whatever he desires in my life but I will disrupt the intention of the enemy in the place of prayer I am standing in the authority of Christ I am seated in heavenly places and so I speak in one place and it is heard in another place that everything that would oppose the will of God in my life let it fall to the wayside let God arise and let his enemies be scattered You are not hopeless. You don't just need to watch things as they happen. You, you are not powerless. You do not just have to accept the way things are. But no, you can stand in the place of prayer and see God release answers. Father, release fresh grace in this hour for intercession and prayer. Release fresh grace upon your people by the power of your spirit. I'm telling you, there's a fresh grace in this room available for those who say, I'm, I'm accepting the invitation. Just lift those hands and receive. There's a fresh grace coming upon the people of God by the power of the Holy Spirit to accept the invitation into the place of prayer. And you shall see great and wondrous victories in the place of prayer. You shall see mighty victories in the place of prayer for God is equipping and anointing his people for this last day to see mighty victories in the place of prayer to see spirits move and to see principalities dislodged and to see things uprooted to see mulberry trees uprooted and mountains cast into the sea to see Goliath's fall and the Jericho walls fall down he will shut mouths of lions and he will deliver his people out of red seas but it will be in the midst of a people who pray Every spirit of perversion assigned to your children, we disrupt the intention of the enemy now in the name of Jesus. Everything is sent to confuse and to cause chaos in their mind. Everything causing them to throw away that which is righteous and integral in the name of Jesus. We stop the plan of the enemy over your children. In Jesus' name, Satan, your, your hand is no longer permitted upon our children. We loose them in the authority of Christ and we say they shall be victorious. They shall shall be righteous they shall walk in integrity they shall know the Lord they shall be leaders and not followers they shall be the lender and not the borrower they shall be the head and not the tail in the name of Jesus every plan of the enemy sent against your children we call it not in Jesus name I went into the place of prayer there was a a seal a might and a strength that the Spirit of God is meeting his people within the place of prayer if you will go and please if, if the corporate gathering is the only place you pray let that change today let that change today 
take it upon yourself. If you are a mother and a father, take it personal. Whenever you see the, the devil doing things in your children and in your family, do not allow that to go unspoken for. Don't allow him to meddle. In the name of Jesus, you take authority and you disrupt the plans of the enemy. And no matter how long it takes, we shall see the victory in Jesus' name. If you're in this room and you do not know the Lord Jesus, this moment is for you. And I know that there are things to do and places to go, but please hear me. 1 John says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Destroy, completely eradicate. The devil doesn't have to have a say in your life. We understand that the adversary attacks, but in the life of the believer, he has no authority. The only authority he has is the one you partner with in disobedience to God. But you who do not belong to Jesus, you are under the influence of the adversary who tempts you with sin, who causes you to stumble and to fall. You are deeply aware right now, even as I speak, that there are urges and addictions, temptations and things that you find yourself engaging in that you do not want to engage in. You talk to yourself and say, I will do that no longer. You, you try in your own human effort and power to stop doing those things and yet in your own human effort and power you cannot stop doing those things. I want you to know that it is not your fault. It is the fact that you are a slave to sin and a slave to the ruler of this world, the devil. But Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. It is by placing your faith in what Jesus Christ has done upon the cross that not only do you receive the forgiveness of your sin, but you receive the freedom from sin because you now receive the power of the Holy Spirit. The same, Christ, the same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives within you and now you have the ability to say no to sin. It is no longer the fact that you are tempted with no escape. Now when you are tempted, there is a way of escape provided by the power of the Holy Spirit where you are now able to resist temptation, resist the devil, and he will flee. You are, have the ability to live a life of righteousness, integrity, holiness, one that pleases God. Because when you surrender to Jesus, you are loosed from the power and the works of the devil. I want you to know, friend, if you are in this room and you do not know the Lord Jesus, today is the day where you can be saved and set free, where you can be redeemed, receiving forgiveness of your sin, where all the guilt and the shame, the condemnation and the heaviness that you've been carrying will immediately lift supernaturally as the forgiveness of Jesus who has already made a way to forgive you of your sins. All you must believe, all you must do is believe in what he has already done. Friend, if you are in this room, I am deeply aware of the enemy who the scripture says is trying to blind you to the reality of the gospel. And so there is this inner war. And because I am aware of this, I'm gonna ask every believer in this room to pray, even if it's quietly within your own heart, to pray for those right now that the Holy Spirit wants to snatch from the eternal flames of fire and bring into His glorious presence. Friend, if you do not know the Lord Jesus, today is your day to repent of your sins, which simply means to acknowledge that you have been going in the wrong direction and now turn to God and run to Him, to repent of your sins and to believe in what Jesus has done. He who knew no sin became sin so that you could become the righteousness of God, which is to say Jesus didn't just die for you. He died as you. He took your place upon the cross. He took the wrath of God. He took lashes upon his back, nails in his hands, all for the sake of you and I, that we would be reconciled back to God and made right by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. This is true for everyone who will believe in him. And so, friend, today, I want to extend that opportunity and that invitation to you. You know who you are. You've been running from God. 
You've been bound by sin. And today is the day you can be liberated from your sin and set on a path of righteousness by the power of the Holy Spirit. All it requires of you is that you repent of your sin and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is Savior and the one who is Lord, the one who rules over, the one who commands. You are now saying from this day forward, my life belongs to him. I will follow him wholeheartedly. I will lay down my own life and I will give my life to Jesus. If that's you, friend, on the count of three, I'll extend that invitation to you so you can respond and say, I'm going to follow Jesus. On the count of three, if that's you, I want you to lift that hand. One, God loves you so much. Two, don't let anybody stop you from this moment. You do not get good to get God. You get God and he makes you good. You don't have to do anything to deserve this moment. God has given you this moment. Now accept the mercy while it is available. Three, if that's you, lift that hand. One, two, three. If you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to surrender your life to Jesus, I see hands going up all across this room. I see hands going all up across this room. Can we give the Lord praise? The devil has just received another defeat and God has demonstrated his power and his victory. Now listen, everybody praying this prayer, it is not the prayer that saves you, but it is your faith that saves you. And specifically, if you raise that hand, I know that the Holy Spirit is doing a deep work on your heart, in your heart. I want you to pray this out loud, meaning it sincerely. Would you say this? Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you just as I am. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. I repent of my sin I turn away from unrighteousness and Jesus I turn to you Jesus I receive your forgiveness for my sin now fill me with your Holy Spirit and empower me to live a life that pleases you from this day forward I confess you as my Lord and as my Savior, the power of sin is broken, for I belong to Jesus. In Jesus' name, someone said amen. Someone said amen. Now this is so important. I saw those wonderful and precious hands that were raised. This is what we would hate to have happen. We would hate for you to go into the world, which is wild, and be torn apart by the adversary because you didn't have a community, because you didn't have brothers and sisters, and because you didn't know the next steps and how to walk this thing out. And so this is what we would desire, is that someone who is beside you to bring you to Jesus. If somebody lifted their hand, would you grab them by the hand and bring them to Jesus? That's it, I saw those hands. If someone raised their hand, would you grab them by the hand and bring them to Jesus? We want to congratulate you. We want to pray for you. We want to celebrate you. The power of sin is broken. The devil is defeated. Jesus is victorious. And because Jesus is victorious, and you place your faith in Him, you are victorious. Hallelujah. 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 Would you just ex extend your hands? I know we're taking a bit of time. Would you extend your hands to those who have come forward? I sense the Lord wanting to do a deep work here. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that every addiction be broken now in the name of Jesus. Every vice, every snare, even the bondage to pornography, Father, we break its power in the name of Jesus. Let it be broken now in the name of Jesus. We thank you that because they are in Christ, they are a new creation, that all things have passed away and all things have become new. We thank you that they have become those who have surrendered their lives to you. And from this day forward, the power of sin is broken. We declare this in Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen somebody shout amen hallelujah